Good morning and welcome to Southridge Church Online. We are so glad that you're here to worship with us. My name is Megan Beha, and I'm the Next Steps Coordinator here at the church. And I have three tips to make this the most memorable experience for you guys in your house. Tip number one, cast the service to the biggest screen in your house. Tip number two, turn the volume up so you can hear it. And tip number three, stand to your feet and let's get ready to worship. I count on one thing, the same God who never fails. You won't fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who never lay is working all things out. Working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high. Oh, 
blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no We are so excited to have you worship with us today. If you are new here, and maybe this is your first time checking us out online, we want to invite you to connect with us. Send a text to the number 304-825-2595, and in that text bubble, just type out SRC online so that someone from our staff can connect with you. Right now is the time that we would typically be moving into receiving our offering, so we want to invite you to continue to give faithfully to Southridge Church. Um, and we want to thank you for your support. There are two ways that you can give to Southridge, and you can go to src.life slash giving, or you can click on the Give tab um, if you're watching Southridge Church online today. Let me pray for us, and we'll continue worshiping. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to continue worshiping you, Lord, from the comfort of our homes, on our computer screens, on our TVs, Lord. God, thank you for this gift of technology. Um, Lord, and the minds to use it. God, thank you for the gifts that we're about to receive. Lord, would you bless the givers? God, we just thank you for our church. We thank you for Southridge, and we thank you for the blessing that it is, Lord. God, be with us the rest of the week as we, um, God, as we learn how to continue to go through this life, Lord, and go through these uncertain times. God, speak to our hearts through the message today. We love you, and we thank you. It's in your name. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, 
Welcome to Southridge Church. Uh, we're continuing on in our Upside Down series where we've been studying through uh, the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus, probably his most popular, most well-known words. And uh, we're wrapping up chapter 5 this morning. And as we get going, I want you right there from where you're sitting at home, close your eyes, 
And imagine with me just for a moment. You were out to dinner with all your friends, having a nice night. The evening's now over, you're walking to your car. And out of nowhere, you're blindsided. Someone knocks you to the ground and begins to beat you within an inch of your life. Now, not only that, but they also take your wallet, take all of your credit cards, debit cards, they empty out all your bank account, they steal your car, and not only did they do this to you, but they do it to every single person that you know or love. Now, I know, if you're like me, the very thought of that makes something begin to burn within me. So much anger, so much angst, like if this really did happen, somebody would get it. Somebody would be really sorry that they picked the wrong person. That's what wells up within me. Now, just imagine this. The person's arrested, they stand trial, and there you are at the trial. You look your attacker and the one that's done you so wrong right in the face. You look them eye to eye, and rather than this anger and this malice and the need for revenge bubbling up in your heart, as you look across the room, you, you catch eyes with each other, and you feel this incredible peace within and then you begin to have this odd feeling of love towards the one that did you wrong. I, I don't know, if you're like me, this seems impossible. This seems like there's no way in the world that I could ever love someone that did something like that to me. It just doesn't seem possible at all. And yet, as we wrap up the first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, this is exactly what Jesus is going to command of us. It's exactly what he's going to tell us that we ought to do, is that we ought to love our enemies, those that have hurt us, those that have done us wrong, that we're to love them. And, and for me, I go, I, I just want to throw my hands up in the air and go, that seems impossible. That just doesn't seem like it could ever happen. And the, the message that we've been conveying throughout this whole Upside Down series up to this point is that this new kingdom way of life Jesus is talking about, it's not possible just in and of ourselves. It's not just possible in my own strength. I can't muster up enough goodness just on my own, but I have to live the kingdom life totally and completely surrendered to God and dependent on Him. And learning to love my enemies no matter how heinous the thing that they did to me was. Learning to love my enemies is going to be a difficult lesson, but it's definitely possible if I can learn to live in a posture of surrendered obedience to God and complete dependence upon Him. We are going to be in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43. This is the final section of this uh, teaching on a greater righteousness that Jesus has been talking about for the past couple of weeks in the Sermon on the Mount. Final section, Matthew 5, beginning in verse 43, says this, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemy. Now, this is a total change-up from the rest of the sections in this passage because the rest of them, Jesus was 100% quoting Scripture. He was saying, in the Old Testament it says this, but here's what I say. And what Jesus does here in verse 43, it's like partial. He says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor. And he goes, yeah, I've heard that before. That's in Leviticus chapter 19, 18. But then he goes, you've not only heard that it was said that you should love your neighbor, but also that you should hate your enemies. Oddly enough, that portion about hating your enemies cannot be found anywhere in the Bible. So what's Jesus talking about? How, where did they hear that at? If it's not in their uh, ancient scripts, uh, scriptures, if it's not in their holy teachings, it, where did it come from? Well, the prevailing thought of, among scholars is that the idea of hating your enemies was so culturally accepted by everyone in the ancient world that even the scribes and the Pharisees that would teach um, the Jews um, the Torah and would teach people that this would be added into the teaching that yes, you should love your neighbors and it is more than okay to hate your enemies. This was the prevailing thought of the day, especially in the first Century. And oddly enough, here we are over 2,000 years later, and this is still a pretty 
um, prevailing thought among, among most people. If people are difficult, if they've hurt you, if they're hard to get along with, you don't have to have any love with them, have nothing to do with them, write them off and move on. We hope nothing good ever happens to them. And, and I mean, that's totally normal. You would get patted on the back in our world today if you lived like this. And Jesus is going, look, this is not the way that we're going to do it in my kingdom. There is no command in the Christian faith to hate whatsoever. And isn't that interesting? Because we get blamed all the time for being a religion of hate. We get blamed all the time for being a hateful people. And there's not one place in our Holy Scriptures, there's not one command of Jesus for His um, followers to ever hate anyone. Now where did this idea that we're a hateful bunch of people actually come from? It comes from a misconception in our culture that any time that you do not 100% agree with someone else, or any time that you have an opinion contrary to someone else, or any time that there's not universal acceptance or approval of a certain behavior, that the person that does not approve or does not accept must then be hateful. And I want to correct that thought process. It is not unloving whatsoever to hold people accountable for bad behavior. It's not unloving to tell people that the Bible says that there are certain things that are sin. And and it's not unloving. In fact, love always requires a sense of justice. Love demands that there be a sense of right and wrong. Because without there being a sense of right and wrong and a, a standard to hold people to, there could be no such thing as love. And let me explain this to you like this. Let's go back to the first scene that I painted for you. You get attacked. You're standing in court. You're angry. That person did you wrong. And you're looking to the judge. You're looking to the judge to do the right thing. Now just imagine that that judge gets up and goes, you know what? I love you so much. He says this to your attacker. I love you so much. I'm going to let you go. Scot free. No penalty. No justice. Now, you would have to argue that any judge that did that, that did not hold people accountable for bad behavior, that they are not a good judge, that they are not a loving judge, because a loving judge would always, always serve justice when it is due. So, this is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus held people accountable. Yes, He 100% loved them. Loved them to a fault, possibly. And yet, always 100% held them accountable. When he he, um, interacts with the lady in John chapter 8 who's been caught in adultery, he says, I don't condemn you. There's the love, unconditional love. Now leave your life of sin. That's the accountability. He doesn't pat her on the head in her sin and go, hey, that's okay. You just keep doing what you're doing and I love you. No, that's not the way love works. Love always tells the truth. Love always tells the truth. If you were driving your car towards a cliff at 100 miles an hour, and I knew that that cliff was there, and you didn't, it would not be loving of me to go, hey, you you just have your own truth. You have your own truth that the cliff's not really there, so therefore, you go and you just drive off that cliff. That would be the most unloving. I, I imagine that the person in the car, when they find out that I didn't say anything, would be very upset with me. They would not think that I loved them. Because love always tells the truth, even when it hurts. So love does not mean that we accept all behaviors as morally acceptable. That's not, that is a false dichotomy put forth in our culture. We, we can love people without affirming everything that they do. And in fact, it's for their good that we do not affirm everything they do. If someone didn't tell me that I was a knucklehead from time to time, if someone didn't tell me that I was wrong from time to time, I would be an even bigger mess than I already am. True love leads with the truth. We don't always just rubber stamp everything as morally acceptable. God has put forward a standard and we ought to tell people about that standard because it's the most loving thing we can do. Because if you truly love people, you don't want to see them living lives of sin because we know sin hurts people. We know sin destroys relationships. We know sin destroys communities. We know sin keeps us separated from God. Why would we ever tell someone that it's okay for them to live lives of sin if we know ultimately that's not for their good? So Christianity is not a religion of hate. The only thing that we ever read about in this is being a religion of love, and love always tells the truth. In fact, here's what Jesus says. He goes on. He goes, 
uh, verse 43, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, here's Jesus' command, love your enemies. He didn't, wait, he didn't say friends? No, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, now this, is, this is the message. This is the essence of the Christian um, morality right here. This is the essence of the Christian ethic. We're to love, but not just the easy ones to love, but even the most difficult. And he, he here mentions, now remember, Matthew's writing in the first century, and this is to people that are going to be persecuted, they're going to be burned alive, they're going to be fed to lions, they're going to lose their um, jobs, they're going to be dr- like just horribly persecuted. And, and Matthew says to the, G- Jesus says to these people, He goes, even the people that persecute you, the ones that have done you wrong, the ones that have done horrible things to you, the the measure of love is, are you able to love them, not just your family and friends that are easy to love? That's what the new ethic is. We don't just love those that are just like us. We don't just love people that have the same hobbies as us. We don't just love people that it's easy to get along with. We love even those that seek to do us harm. Now, this is something that I've been talking a lot about um, through this series, and I keep getting this question, like, what does this love really look like? What does this love look like? Because it doesn't seem possible. And here, I want to just outline this for you. These are the things that this love looks like. Can you seek the good of the person that hurts you? So, modern example of this. Let's say your arch enemy, the one that has done you wrong, cheated on you, lied to you, maybe even physically harmed you, whatever it is, Let's say that something great happens to them. They get a job promotion. They post it out on Facebook. Can you be genuinely happy for them? That's what this love looks like. I I didn't say that you invited them over for coffee and and cupcakes, and I didn't say that that, that, that everything went back to the way that it was. No. Can you be genuinely happy for them? Can you pray for them daily? Would you sacrifice personally for them if, if they had a need? I'm not saying put yourself in a dangerous situation. I'm not saying put yourself in an unwise situation where someone that has harmed you over and over and over again gets free access back to your home. That, that, that's, that's foolishness. That's not love either. Because you have to love the people in your home enough to not let dangerous things in. So that's not love either. What this love looks like is I can seek the good of those that have hurt me. I can pray for them. I, I can wish them well. I, I can even sacrifice for them if they had a need, and I can do that without any malice or hate in my heart whatsoever. But I do that wise. I do that, I don't just let everyone come back in if it's not the wise thing to do. Now, there's going to be times that, that the Lord is going to move so powerfully through all of this that. There's going to be relationships that you thought were completely severed forever that he can heal in a moment. And there's going to be relationships that... So I'm not saying that, this is, that, that you're always going to hold everyone at an arm's length. Sometimes God's going to move so powerfully that he will restore everything plus some that got broken in that relationship. He has the power to do that. And so the message of the Christian faith isn't just love, but it's love even for the most difficult people imaginable. Verse 45 says this, he says that we love those that persecute us, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Here's what Jesus is saying. God's kids look like Him. John tells us in one of his letters that God is love, so God's children must also exude and reflect God's love and goodness in this Creation. We are never more like our Father in heaven than when we are loving people, even those that are most difficult to love. That, that, that's what makes us like our Father. Like Landon, my son Landon, I could not deny that kid um, even if I wanted to. He looks like me. He acts like me. He talks like me. He has the same hobbies as me. Why? Because he's mine. He's mine, so therefore I know He's my child because He reflects me in everything that He does, in in every way. Everyone could look at Him and go, that's definitely Scott's son. He looks like Him, acts like Him, has the same hobbies. He's definitely... And and that's what Jesus is saying. He goes, look, if you're a person of the kingdom of God, you should be easily identified as a child of God because you look so much like your father. There's so much love pouring out of you that you should be so much like your father. Everyone would go, without a shadow of a doubt, this one belongs to God. And Jesus goes on, he goes, here's 
Here's something um, that levels the playing field. It makes a good rationale for loving those that are difficult to love. He says this phrase, and on the surface, maybe it doesn't make much sense to you, but here's what he's saying. He goes, He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. What's Jesus saying? He says, God provides for the righteous and the unrighteous. He gives good things to the righteous and the unrighteous, the, the good and the evil. This, this is what in some theological circles would be referred to as common grace. There are certain things that God has just given to His creation that everyone has access to. It, it's His goodness in the creation, and it's not cut off from pe- to people just because they're not in right relationship with the Lord. This, this is why, for instance... Sometimes when you are getting a, uh, when, when you're applying for a job, you're applying for it and you're going, God, you're praying for it, you're praying for it, and you get passed over for the job and someone that's not a believer gets the job. Why? Be- because there's just, there's just goodness in this world and it's available to everyone and, and you don't get special privileges just because you're a, a child of God um, in, in, in that way. There's going to be certain people that are rich and they're believers. There's going to be certain people that are rich and they're non-believers. There's going to be poor people that are believers. There are going to be poor people that are not believers. There's going to be people that get provided for that are believers. There are people that are not provided for that are believers. All of this is part of how God runs His creation. Yes, there are certain things that we have access to as followers of Jesus Christ. We have certain access to God. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. He gives us spiritual gifts to bless those around us. We, we have His favor in all of this, but, but just listen, there are certain things that are still accessible to those that are not believers. And Jesus is saying, just look at the fact that God doesn't just turn His back on people that want nothing to do with Him. He still provides sun. He still provides rain. The two things that you need to, uh, two of the things that you need to, to grow crops, and this is an agricultural um, society He's teaching to, He's going, look, he's still going to give the non-believers what they need in this life. He's still going to be good to them because God doesn't just turn his back on people just because they want nothing to do with him, and neither should we. He's actually using this as an example. He goes, look, if God provides for the needs of non-believers, and he provides for people that even actively work against him, and he will, he, he, they can get rich in his creation, they can have a nice life in his creation, if that's possible, that he's going, look, then, then you need to have love for these people as well. You don't treat them like second-class citizens. You don't act as if you're better than them. You're just different. You're different. What makes us different? Verse 46 tells us this, And if you love those who love you, what reward will that get you? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Here's what Jesus is saying. I love this. He goes on, verse 47, And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do you even, don't don't even pagans do that? I love Jesus' rationale here. He goes, look, you're feeling really good about yourself because you love the easy people to love. In fact, you pat yourself on the back because you love your family and your friends so well. And he goes, that's not the level that I'm talking about. He's, he's going, my love transcends just those that are easy to love. And he points out the two vilest, nastiest people that the Jews could have possibly loved. The tax collectors and the pagans. They hated the tax collectors because the tax collectors worked for Rome and they were traitors for their own people. They hated the pagans because the pagans didn't follow uh, the one true God of Israel. I mean, they hated them. So Jesus goes right after these two groups and he's telling the the disciples and the religious leaders, he goes, you're no better than the worst people that you have in your mind. You're no better than the vilest, nastiest, slimiest, sketchiest people that you can imagine. You're no better than them if you only love those that love you. Jesus is going, look, everyone takes care of their own. Unless there's something like really, 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 really wrong with you, Everyone in one way or another, this transcends culture, this transcends all boundaries, we have a tendency to take care of our own. It's human nature. And he goes, you don't get commended for just taking care of your own. There's a higher standard. The the thing that sets you apart in the kingdom of God is not just loving your family and your friends well, which you should do, but it's also loving those that are the most difficult to love. Loving those that have hurt you the deepest. That's what sets you 
apart. We're no better just because we love people that are easy to love. We show that we hold ourselves to a higher moral standard when we love the most difficult to love, when we can pray for them, when we can hope for their good. Because that's exactly what God does. Not any of us deserved His love whatsoever. Not any of us deserved His blessing. Not any of us deserve what He's done for us. And here He is loving us. And we were enemies of His. We were enemies. And God treats us like friends. This is what the example that we must set. It's not, I'm not saying it's easy. That's why we started out talking about we have to be dependent upon God. This is only possible through the power of His Spirit working within you. Now Jesus wraps up this whole section Not just the love your enemy section, but the whole section on the greater righteousness with this one verse. And on the surface, it's going to seem really challenging, and you're going to go, I I really don't know about this. I, I really don't think much of this. I don't like this. Here's what he says, verse 48. Be perfect. Perfect. Yes, perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, if you're not new to Southridge Church, you probably know our mission statement is that we want to be the perfect place, even online, even in your homes, for imperfect people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So what is Jesus talking about with this be perfect stuff? Didn't you say that we're supposed to be the perfect place for imperfect people? Now you're saying that we've got to be perfect. Is this some type of um, switcheroo? Are you, trying to, are, are you trying to confuse us? Or did you get us in at, a, at one level and then say, hi, I faked you out, it's really this? Like, what's the deal with this, Jesus? Well, first off, anytime you see the word perfect in the New Testament, it, it's best to look at that word as meaning mature and whole. Mature and whole. The word perfect is a little misleading, although I understand why the Bible translators used it. Look at the word perfect. When Jesus says, um, be perfect, look at it as saying, be mature in your faith and be whole. Be made whole. Is Jesus setting an unachievable goal when He says that we need to be mature and whole? Absolutely not. Here's what He's doing. He is upping the ante as He's been doing the whole Sermon on the Mount. He's going, there is a new way to live. There is a better way of being human. And it's by living out this ethic that He puts forth in the Sermon on the Mount. And when we do that, he doesn't set an unachievable goal. Rather, he sets a goal for us to strive towards, knowing that if when we do fall, his grace and his mercy are there for us when we don't, uh, when we don't measure up. And he understands that that's going to happen. This is what I like to call the Christian crutch. The Christian crutch. And here's what the Christian crutch is. Well, nobody's perfect. Well, nobody's perfect. And this just drives me crazy whenever I hear this from Christians when they've messed something up, when, they, when they're living in sin and they know it and they're convicted by it but they don't want to change. They have this thought, well, nobody's perfect. Well, nobody's perfect. And I want to go, I know that nobody's perfect, but there's something really wrong in your soul if you can live a life of sin and not be bothered by it. There's something really wrong if you cannot love the way Jesus loves. There's something really wrong if you can just outright reject the commands of Jesus. There's something wrong in your soul. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ and you're okay with sin in your life, it doesn't drive you insane. It doesn't drive you to make changes. It doesn't drive you deeper into the Word and deeper into prayer. There's something not right inside. Perhaps you didn't really meet Jesus when you thought you met Jesus. If you can be okay with settling for less than God's best, there's something not right. That's what Jesus is doing. He goes, look, I know that you're not going to be perfect. That's what my grace is for. But don't settle. Don't, don't, Don't be okay with where you're at. There's always more. There's deeper to go. There's farther to go in our relationship with Him. That's why one of our core values is here is that we never stop growing. We never get to a point in our walk with Jesus where we go, that's enough, I've learned enough, I've grown enough, I've been transformed enough. There's always more. Until your dying day, there will be more transformation. There can be more ways that God develops love in your heart. There will be more ways that God develops you than you could ever imagine. We never stop growing. And that's what Jesus is here is telling us. He didn't just give us a new set of rules to follow in this chapter. I don't want you to look at the Sermon on the Mount as a new set of rules, and if I can just learn to follow these, then I'll be good. That's legalism. That's not what Jesus 
has uh, called us to. He's giving examples of what it looks like to live a Holy Spirit-led life. Because this isn't an exhaustive list of how we ought to live. He's just going, look, when the Spirit's in control of your life, this is what it looks like. When the Spirit's not in control, this is not what it will look like whatsoever. That's what he's doing. This isn't an exhaustive list. There's not an exhaustive list of do's and don'ts. It's every day I wake up and I surrender myself to God and I say, I'm totally dependent upon your leading. Would you help me to be a better human every day? Would you help me to love better? Would you help me to be a better husband or wife, father, mother, co-worker, friend, son, daughter? Would you help me? Would you help me to love people the way you love them? Would you help me to see people the way you see them? Would you help me to treat them the way that you treat them? It is a daily um, dependence upon the Lord that continually transforms us. That's what Jesus here is talking about. So as we get ready to close this morning, I do want to talk to those of you that you've never made a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Just like you, everyone that has ever lived, we started out as enemies of God. We started out as enemies of God. Now I know not everyone that is not in a relationship with Jesus sees themselves like that, but the Bible tells us if we're not followers of Jesus, if we have not trusted in Him for salvation, then we are enemies of God. But here's the good deal. God loves His enemies. God loves His enemies enough to send His Son Jesus. This is what we celebrated last week. He loves them enough to send His Son Jesus to die a death in our place that can forgive us of our sins, that can give us right relationship with God, that will fill us with His Spirit so we can be transformed into His image more and more every day. It's a life-changing decision because God doesn't hate His enemies. In fact, He loves you so much, He would love nothing more than for you to respond to Him this morning. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Thank you for always being with us. Thank you for the fact that you don't hate your enemies, but you love even those that are far from you right now. And you show that by the way that you even bless them in their unrepentant state. I pray, God, that today there would be many that would step into a relationship with you and that their lives might never be the same. Father, I pray for those that, that perhaps they thought at one point that they had made things right with you. But today it seems very clear that they have not been growing, they have not been transformed, and they want to repent and turn to you as well. I pray that there would be a great harvest of souls today. In Jesus' name, amen.
when I cannot fend or fall on you. Jesus, show my hope and stay. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand or fall on you. Jesus, show my Thanks so much for joining us here at Southridge Church Online. First, if today you made a decision to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, would you let us know by sending us a text that says Jesus to 304-825-2595 so we can get you into a digital discipleship process that will help you take your next steps in your faith journey. A couple things going on that we want you to be aware of. First, on April 25th from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., we're hosting a drive through prayer experience up here at our church parking lot. You'll stay in your car with the windows up and you'll drive station to station where there'll be different things for you to pray about as well as a way for you to tell us about any prayer needs that you have. It'll be nice to be able to see your face even um, though you'll be in your car and we'll be outside. It'll be nice to be able to see each other but also to be able to do something for our community um, by surrounding them in prayer during this time. The other thing I want you to know about is we're gonna begin to collect food uh, for our partner, the Bread of Life Food Pantry. Um, they have a great need right now as they're serving um, those that are hungry right here in our community, and we want to partner with them. So we're going to be posting a list of food that we'll be collecting. You can drop that off each week on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Just the front doors will be unlocked for you to just open it, drop your donation off inside the church lobby, and then we'll be able to get the food to the food pantry to help those in need. So we'll be posting that list on Facebook and on Instagram, as well as sending out a church email. If you're on our email list, you'll get it that way as well. All other information can be found at src.life. Thank you so much for joining us. and We hope to see you again soon.